This year marks the 50th birthday of your favourite Sunday World newspaper. To celebrate, we're looking back over some of the front page stories and the scandals with the big name journalists who made it the people's paper. So join us to reel in the years over the coming weeks on Crime World and at a special 50th birthday party event to be held on September 27th at the Sugar Club in Dublin. We have 50 tickets to give away. For information on how to enter, go to our Crime World social media channels on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Sunday World is 50, a Crime World special. So you've managed to avoid the crime beat for most of the decades you've been in the Sunday world, but you finally, we've dragged you in. So welcome to Crime World. I, man- <laughs> I managed to get out of it, Nicola, before yeah. you, before you, you came along. <laughs> yeah, because I, I did a bit of crime when I, when I started off here. I would have thought it was difficult in the Sunday world to avoid it, really. Very difficult because that was uh, the yeah. concentration. It was it was crime and show, biz- yeah. show business and, and, and sport. And, you know, when I came in in the 80s, uh, the whole uh, heroin scene was, yeah, yeah. was rampant, you know, with Larry Dunn and the family. So um, I did go out on, on the Concerned Parents marches. Did you, yeah? Again, yeah, yeah, I remember being uh, doorstepping with 30 or 40 in, in city people, yeah. uh, Tony Filoni. Right. King Scum, yeah, who was, at, who, who's, who was named by... Des Eakin in, yeah. in an article when he first... Uh, and like, him. were you... So where did you, where were you coming from? You throw it into this, like, where were you... Where had you... Where come? had I come from? Yeah. I had come from a very different world, Nicola. Yeah. <laughs> I came from... I started off... Um, I trained on a newspaper in Mullingard, uh, the Midland Topic. Right. And uh, and then I was five years there. And then it was nearly two years, a year and a half, on the Westmead off the Independent, based in, in Tullamore. So I was covering... Um, Westmead County Council, the monthly meetings where there were complaints about the potholes and country roads. And I was covering the, the health board in, in Tullamore and, yeah. you know, um, the town commissioners. And did you do the so. district courts and that kind of thing? Yeah, I did the district courts. It, it, the topic had a policy of, funnily enough, of not doing courts. No, some of the local papers, it was a little bit too close to home. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they didn't do it. So I'd spent five years there and I had no court experience. So I was very lucky that I moved on to the Westmead Offaly Independent. Right. I started covering courts because I, I got that experience. And yeah. Sean Boyne, who was the news editor here, one of the guys who hired me, um, he said to me, you know, if, if you didn't have that experience, uh, we couldn't have hired you. Really? Yeah. So. And you had done rap mines like. We no, I, I did no. it the old fashioned way. Um, right. I did. I did the Leaving Cert. I did a, <laughs> I did a secretarial course in a, in a tech afterwards, then a local tech in Longwood, County Mead, where near where yeah. I come from, uh, with fourteen or fifteen uh, girls, and I was the only boy and the only teenager, and uh, I was, for you. <laughs> and that was it was a bit uh, it was a bit emb- embarrassing. We was short, I had to learn shorthand and typing because you had to learn you had yeah, to have shorthand yeah. to become mm-hmm. a journalist back then, as you know, and uh, and typing. I mean everybody. Everybody can type now, but I was probably the only guy in a 50 mile radius where I came from who could actually type back back there. Probably the only guy in, you know, one of the few. And it was typewriters and you'd have to hammer on them. It was old typewriters. Yeah. I still have my original at home in in the attic that I started off on. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd done that and... What? So you were kind of in your coming up to your late twenties, were you mid twenties? I was mid twenties. You... Yeah. Okay. Twenties. When, when and was there an advertisement for a job in the Sunday World? It was. It was an advertisement, uh, an advert for a, a junior uh, reporter, Gosh. and um, you know, it, it. I was a senior reporter at yeah. this stage uh, on, on the local paper, but the money for a junior reporter in the Sunday World was was uh, was more than what I was earning down there. Yeah. And. Um, so, yeah, and I had made contacts uh, in the Sunday world with, with, with Sean Boyne because I was sending up stories from from the Midlands, like mm-hmm. like a lot of stringers are called. So I yes. was a stringer in, in and the Midlands. And all the good news mm-hmm. editors knew to keep in touch with all the local reporters around the country. So it's when something did happen in their area, they could give feed them the information because a lot of the time the stringers didn't put their names on things. That's right. They fed the information mm-hmm. and got a few bob on the side and kept them going a bit. Yeah. And I had a few wacky stories, you know, I had yeah. one about uh, a local guy who saw a monster in, in a local lake called Crowboy Lock. And um, so that I featured in the paper I was working on, but then I, I sent it to the Sunday World. And yeah. Eamon McCann was the um, was the news editor at the time. Right. Uh, 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 I think Sean had was was out at the time. And um, he said to me, um, uh, uh, you don't expect me to believe this, do you? And, <laughs> <laughs> and, I said, anyway. and I said, well. 
I said, you know, I don't know what to make of it myself, but your man who saw it believes it. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you ever watch that. Ricky Gervais' The Afterlife? Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. this local reporter in it and he's every so often there's scenes. I think it's brilliant. Of course, he directs it himself. I just think it's all his skill set in that. But he's the scenes where he's uh, with the photographer. They're both very bored, local on a local newspaper. And, you know, they find themselves in a room with somebody saying, you know, Jesus's face has come up on a tissue or actually I was watching one through into one the other night and there was a kind of like a man in his 50s dressed as a fully as a baby and his wife sitting right really surly beside him. He identifies as a toddler and your man, Ricky Gervais, the local reporter sitting there just like, you know, I've seen it all. This is just my normal life. I just think that's so <laughs> what local reporting was. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and even on the Sunday world, mm. you know, we were based in Turnure for, for many, many years and people would walk in off the street then. Mm. There was no, you know, there was no social media. No, you know. they had to come and meet you or try and yeah. contact you in some way. And really that's how the doorstep probably started, yeah. which seems like a crass thing to do now to call to somebody's front door after there's been, mm. you know, a tragedy or something like that. But back then, people, there, was, there wasn't an opportunity for them to own their own ability to speak up about something or not. Yeah. You know, nowadays, if something happens... You stick it up on Facebook. You stick it up on Exactly, yeah. you know. Yeah. But it just reminded me there when you are uh, uh, talking about Ricky Gervais. <clears throat> we had Jesus Christ call into the Sunday World in turn your one day. And, um, you know, journalists always dread it being asked, there's somebody down at reception because generally it was never going to be a story. <laughs> but it took up half your day talking to somebody who came in with 15,000 documents. And Yes, you know, yeah. But anyway, this guy was Jesus Christ. So um, I didn't, uh, one of the other reporters was sent down. So after a while, he realized, you know, we, we have, we have a, we, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> security was alerted. Right. And uh the, Jesus the, Christ the, was evicted from Jesus the building. Christ. And as Jesus Christ was being evicted, he said, I'm going to blow up this effing place. <laughs> <laughs> Christian. <laughs> How Christian of him. Yeah. So you went for your interview and um, obviously got the job. I got the job. Yeah, I was, you know, um, Sean Boyne yeah. had been dealing with me for a few years. So. I don't know. I think there were hundreds went for the job. Right. Uh, uh, you know, because obviously it's, they didn't come up very often. No. Uh, and it was the Sunday world. And, uh, you know, it was it was the most popular paper in the country at the time. Yeah. So I think I was lucky in that uh, of all the, the applicants and of all the people they interviewed, they only interviewed a handful. Of them, mm -hmm. You know, um, Sean knew me. I knew my work. Yeah. You know, and you kind of proved yourself already. Realized. The monster in the lake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'd done a feature as well on um, on the show band scene mm. and uh, the, the, the nasty side of the show band scene. Right. Tommy Swarbrick had done an interview with me and he he talked about like, how it was like gangland in, in back in the 60s. Right. Arms, were, arms and legs were broken and all that kind of stuff was going on. Uh, rouse over over money and so uh, he, it was a really hard hitting yeah. uh, feature about the the show band scene and Bill Stewart who was the deputy editor he loved that whole scene right you know? so I that put me on his radar as well and and, and he was had one you of got into guys. that scene when you were based down in 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 the Midlands and the entertainment you, yeah had you been reporting on that? Had you been making a few contacts as well as the local councils and all that? Yeah, I always had an interest in it. Yeah. And uh, I had a music column on on the topic right. when I was there, you know. So I was yeah. meeting all the, the local guys. Yeah. And then the, the show band, I caught the end of the show band scene. And whenever they came to town, mm. you know, I'd, it would give me an excuse. I'm, a, I'm, I'm writing for the local paper, you know, t to talk to them. Yeah. You know, some people use it because I, lo I loved all these guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and some people, you know, went and asked for an autograph. I asked for an interview. Very good. Yeah. And that's what was that scene like at the time? Um, it was it was it was very rough, obviously. Uh, well, no, no. Uh, I, I, this was at the uh, the end of it. But, yeah. apparently, you know, it apparently during the heyday. Yeah, yeah. There was all kinds of stuff went on. What people, you know, vying for to get the best position or within their own group? I, 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 do you know, it's so long ago feud? now. I can't, I can't remember what you know yeah. what, what what the uh, what the arms were broken for, what the legs yeah, were yeah. broken for. But uh, it's always over money anyway. And it was probably a world they were probably on the road all the time, and there was a lot of drink and God yeah, knows. Yeah, I'd say personalities. I say, say it's more to do in in the 
ballroom uh, ballroom scene, you know, yeah. rather than among the bands. Yes. Uh, right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, mm. I'll, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to re- revisit that with, with, with Tommy. So when you started Time World uh, interview exactly. Yeah. When you started up in the in the Sunday World, then what was that experience like, and what was your first day like? Do you remember? It? Well, uh, the, the first first of all, um, I, the first day I came in, there was nobody in, in the Sunday World other other than the advertising department <laughs> because uh, it was a Monday, and and nobody told me, you know. Uh, and then it, it, did you show up all suited and booted? For yeah, work? I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, "Well, there's nobody." Country bo- gobshite up, up, coming in. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and also, um, we had a four day week. Uh, somehow yeah. the unions had negotiated a four-day week. Tuesday to Friday. For Tuesday those to who Friday. Don't know, and to this day, it's Tuesday to Saturday. Yeah, Tuesday to Friday, or 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 Wednesday to Saturday, and you know, but you but you work the shift and every once a month a late night shift, and it was it was yeah. complicated. But it was a four-day week, so I was off every Monday. So I was actually off most Saturdays, Sundays, and Mondays, which which was. Much to the uh, envy of all my my friends Absolutely. who had real jobs. Nice long life. weekend, well before sort of COVID broke up everybody's working weeks. But do you know it's funny the su- people in the Sunday world and on other Sunday newspapers, you kind of like Mondays our day off and yeah. uh, mm. bank holidays really annoy us because everyone else is off on our day off. Yeah, <laughs> and your phone rings on a Monday because other I people know are working, ring. and you feel like going, so <laughs> what are you ringing for? Do you not understand? It's my day off. <laughs> yeah, but. Um, um, but yeah, so, uh, but, you know, it was very daunting, you mm. know, uh, be, you know, because I, suddenly I was thrown into a scene where, like I say, suddenly I was out interviewing uh, con men. I, I know there was one English con guy. I had to follow him around town and I was with a photographer, Liam O'Connor, mm. a great photographer at the time. And there was a photograph of this guy. Uh, I was chasing him and he was chasing down, running down the O'Connell Street with Liam out after him taking right. photographs. And, you know, <clears throat> it was and it was serious mm-hmm. journalism and, and a serious legal aspect to it. So uh, you're in at the deep end. Literally uh, thrown in. Yeah. And, and going out and, and you know, to uh, out, out to Kulak and places like that and in, interviewing poor, unfortunate people mm. uh, like mothers of kids who are on drugs and you know I, I remember um two mothers sitting sitting in an apartment and they had all these needles on the table that had been discarded all around the flats and they were complaining about how the, the junkies mm. uh, were discarding them and th- th- their little kids were picking them up and um and and as she was showing it to me she pricked her her finger all oh, right she's and uh she said to me then should i go to hospital and i'm going I'm going to get the paper sued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, probably, yeah. you know, uh, for whatever hepatitis or, or, or whatever, you know. So, but 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 I I got to see yeah uh, the, the underbelly the, mm. the, of of Dublin. You know, there's another side to Dublin. It's and it's not uh, Grafton Street. It's funny because I always reckoned that um, you know to some people uh, over the years maybe who've looked down their nose on the Sunday World and see it as being an ignorant vehicle. In actual fact, for me, it's the exact opposite because, I mean, for me, I got more of an education working in the Sunday world than I could have ever got in any other job anywhere. Absolutely. I, just, I mean, you see everything. You see people in your own city living in a way that you just cannot imagine and you'd never see otherwise. You get up close and personal with the, you know, I mean, in your gig in particular, you've seen people at the top of their game, height of their success you know, people who have made so much money, but you've also seen the other side of life. I did. <clears throat> I did. And I mean, uh, the, the sheriff, uh, Jerry O'Carroll, saying mm. to me one time, he, he he used to, we used to meet him in the pub and turn your close to the newspaper. And he said to me one time, he said, Eddie, you're a lucky man. You you deal with the beautiful people. He said, yeah. I deal with the dregs of society. Yeah. And they're not the dregs of society, yeah. really. You yeah. know, I mean, they are very unfortunate people. Totally. Couple, very, yeah. you know, disenfranchised, disadvantaged uh, background. And it's awful to see mm-hmm. the living conditions. And, you know, OK, if somebody breaks into my house, it's very difficult to have sympathy f- for that person. Yeah. But I do have sympathy for them mm. because I do know where they come from. Exactly. So, but you really forged your your you know, your your career in the showbiz scene and yeah. in the music scene and with celebrities. And like, how did you do that? Was it from your original contacts that you'd made in, in your original, in your local newspaper role 
that kind of gave you the <clears throat> edge on that. Well, when I joined the paper, I was the young fella. <laughs> and now I'm the old fella, but I was... <laughs> How did that happen? No, no, but, uh, yeah. you sold your soul to the devil, I can tell you something. Everyone knows that, Eddie. <laughs> so um, I started, interviews were coming in for, yeah. for, 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 for music and the guys knew I was interested in, in that scene. So uh, because it was such a, sh- a small staff, mm. uh, there was no scope to specialise in that area. So while I was out in Kulak interviewing yes. people about the drug scene, I could also be in- interviewing you know, you two or mm. whoever it was back then, or all the the eighties bands. Actually, you know, they were all playing in Forever Young there recently, Spandau Ballet, and all those. They, they were coming in, and we were getting offered the interviews. So Sean Boyne was asking me to, would you go and talk to him because I'm the young fellow on the staff. So it it gradually developed. I had the interest. It was yeah. the area I wanted to get into, mm-hmm. and it kept on developing, developing, and I was still doing news, still doing showbiz. And I was getting all these interviews, these celebrity interviews, and it was becoming difficult. But then they took on a couple of new new staff mm-hmm. and they it expanded. Then they, they kind of worked on more or less on crime and stuff like that. And they allowed you. Kind and of, I got more and more yeah. into that. And then in the in the mid 90s, um, Michael Brophy and Colin McGinty came in from uh, INM. Mm. They took over management and 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 Colin was the editor. And I, they appointed me more or less, or they just saw me as the uh, showbiz reporter, mm-hmm. showbiz. And, and so this, Michael Brophy said to me, you're the showbiz reporter. And I said, I am. And I never did another uh, news story again. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so I finally got, yeah, I already had, um, um, I had a, a, a music column on the paper anyway as well, you know. So. But, you know, I think um, on, especially in probably tabloid media, um, you know, the whole role of showbiz celebrity, whatever the, I mean, your showbiz editor, that role is you have to really manage that well, because if you go and do a big sort of expose, you're going to be a flash in the pan as regards being an ongoing showbiz editor or somebody that can be trusted to be brought in for interviews or into, because presumably you're not, it's not always totally and utterly orchestrated by a PR machine. There are times that you will go and bands and celebrities have your trust that they're bringing you into their world, probably into their homes, and you're going away with their trust to write something that isn't going to kind of, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. um, be scandalous or, you know what I mean? I'm sure you've been told many things over the years that you don't write. So it is a very kind of political job, actually. People don't realize that because you have to be providing enough content for the editor and for the newspaper to be happy with um, or whatever medium people are working in nowadays. But you also have to stay friends with the people who matter or else you'll be cut off. You do. You do. And you won't get the interviews. It, It is very difficult. Um, I mean, I'm told an awful lot of stories that will never see the light of day. They'd never see the light of day anyway because, like you, couldn't, because you couldn't prove them. <laughs> well, true, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and they're usually told to me uh, by one person about another person. So, um, I mean, there's always, celebrities have, a, have their, have their they're normal human beings. They have their issues. Mm. And, uh, you know, they, they've, they've gone through affairs, divorces. Um, and sometimes... Uh, they don't want to talk about it. Uh, and that's fine. Mm. But you can refer to it in the article. Um, I mean, every article has to have has to be a bit edgy. You know, it, it, yeah. you know, you know. it has to have something that's, that's going to draw somebody in yeah. and make them interested enough to read to the end of it or to listen or whatever. Exactly. The medium so the, is. They might not want to talk about the affair, but they can talk about the difficulties to have in their, they can talk around it, the difficulties to have in their lives. And I can get them to talk around it. Mm. You know what they're talking about without them dealing with it directly. Um, and it's how you it, it's how you interact with somebody. You know, you're told sometimes by a PR person, the person this person is not going to talk about this. Yeah. Like I remember uh, Michael Hutchins. Uh, yeah. I got an interview with Michael Hutchins three months before he died. Right. Uh, he was in the middle of the, the storm. You know, his 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 affair with uh, Bob Geldof's wife. Yeah. Um, and um, what was her name? Polly Yates. <laughs> Polly Yates. Just excuse me there yeah. a second. Um, Polly Yates. And they said, look, you know, don't bring up the the the, the, the uh, story about Paula, the, what he's going through at the moment. So 
Which is probably a little bit gutting as a journalist that you're going in at this moment that this is such a huge kind of a thing. It's out there in the ether. Yeah. It's been spoken about, but it's you're, the you're up close, story. but you won't talk about it. But it's an interview yeah. with In Excess. Yes. So I, and so it's about the new album coming out. And so I go into, uh, it's in London and I go into the hotel room and uh, uh, he, Michael is in the corner on the phone. And I don't think there were mobile phones then either. So he's, mm-hmm. he's on the he's on the hotel phone and the interview starts with the other the other guys. So I'm talking to them, yeah. to them about In Excess and the album. And then Michael comes over and I'm introduced and I'm Irish. He goes straight into the whole saga about okay. Paula, what's going on, you know, how they're how they're being hounded uh, in the media, who's behind it. And 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 one of the guys in excess is um, Michael. He doesn't want to hear this. And in my head, I'm going, <laughs> I absolutely do. Uh, so so uh, so that you know, sometimes he, he kind of broke that thing himself. Himself, yeah, yeah, himself. Uh, and, and it was not those. And stuff. then he died three months later. He died three. It was one of the last interviews. So he died three months later. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, lovely guy. I'd met him. Once before that, and he did have his issues with mm. with drugs and stuff, you know. Uh, but really nice guy. Uh, but anyway, that's so. Sometimes, sometimes it depends your on stand in the way with rules that the individual yeah. doesn't feel as private about things. That yeah. And the other thing, Nicola, is you know I never wanted to come back on. A PR person from a record company here in Dublin or from one of the promoters, if they tell you that, look, don't bring up this, doesn't it? He just mm-hmm. explode or she will just explode. There's no point in bringing it up because, first of all, they're going to explode and they're not going to give you the interview. Secondly, it's going to come back on that individual who's working for not very big money mm-hmm. in a record company in Dublin or in a PR company or is trying to keep their job. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's not worth it, you know. So, so it's trouble for everybody, basically. It's trouble for everybody. And then you're blacklisted. Yeah. And it, this is such a small town, isn't it? You can't be that, trusted. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be careful. You have to keep everybody. It's a tightrope. Yes. It is. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. Yeah. But I mean, obviously, there were times you went out to, like that time. You went out to get an interview that should have been relegated maybe further back in the paper. But obviously the content of it then brings it, it does. right up the front. Yeah. Um, and what's, were you blown away by the celebrities when you started meeting them? Did you ever kind um, of, are uh, you a bit starstruck? Uh, Would you uh, still uh, like? Um, only if I meet somebody that I'm a fan of, you know. Yeah. But initially, yes, yeah, I, I was, uh, but it had to be, but then you meet them straight, straight away, unless they're kind of divas or whatever, yeah. um, you realize, well, it's just a, a man here, another man here, it's just yeah. another woman here. And, you know, if they're engaging, it's, it's grand, but, yeah. but in the, obviously sit, it's like going on stage, mm. sitting outside that hotel uh, bedroom, you know, when somebody else is in doing the interview and you're next, very nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. Do so you feel like you're on, you're being auditioned almost. Uh, no, you're no. in that position. No, but you, you know, you, 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 you're worried about getting off to a good start with the person. Yeah. What you're going to say, you're not going to make a, an idiot of yourself, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and to get the conversation flowing. Because you only ever have like 20 minutes, half an hour. And I'm sure some of them, I mean, like anything, they can be having a bad day and bad humor yeah. and maybe try to take it out on you. Have you kind of a few that you've. Yeah, a bit nasty. Know, I've had um, uh, some some people were 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 um, can, can be a bit prickly, but I you know in the early days I probably had a few little incidents. Bec- that's just because of my lack of experience and you know lack of confidence uh, and maybe lack of knowledge mm-hmm. um, interviewing them about you know th- their careers and their music and dealing with them as as the individuals that the the animal that they are, the individual that they are. Mm. Now I've learned to. You know, I don't like to say it, work people, but, you know, get on with people. But look, experience is great because you kind of, you gain in your own confidence and your own knowledge. Yeah. And you probably, I mean, I always feel very comfortable interviewing somebody or being interviewed if I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. If I don't, I'm like an absolute bag of nerves. If I'm unprepared and I don't know anything about the subject matter or I'm sure people can hear it all the time if I'm if I'm not totally confident or ready for well, it. That's exactly it. And in fact, you know, as, as a general reporter, you're expected to know 
Everything. A bit about everything. A bit everything. about everything. And not a lot about and anything. you don't know a lot about anything. <laughs> yeah. You know a bit about everything. But, you know, so I can, you're, you're there fact finding really. Yeah. And, uh, but it's nerve wracking when you're in, in, dealing with somebody on a subject that you know very little about. Yeah. Um, and I suppose I was like that in the beginning. I'm 40 years doing it now. So uh, I, I suppose I was like that for for a good few years on the, on the music scene, mm -hmm. trying to get to grips with how this big scene works. It's a machine and, yeah. you know, and there's so many facets to it. And and then, you know, somebody's career uh, you, nowadays is very easy to um, to get a biog mm -hmm. uh, on some big celebrity. If you're told you've, you're going to talk to whoever, um, Rod Stewart in, in 10 minutes. Yeah. Go, oh, Jesus, I know nothing about Rod Stewart. Yeah. Well, he's one guy I would know something about. But, yeah. um, you know, you'd have to ring your back then you'd have to ring a record company. Say, would you have a biog on Rod Stewart? Could you fax it, you know, or talk to somebody in the record company? Give me 10 facts on Scribble Rod Stewart. Down now you just, details, it's Wikipedia. Yeah. It's all on the, it's, the touch. Yeah, and, yeah. 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 It actually takes my value uh, as, as, the, as the expert in that area. It reduces all our values as experts in that area because mm -hmm. it's all there on the internet now. So obviously there was the kind of those international rock stars and um, huge big bands and all the rest of it. But you always had an interest in the homegrown talent and, mm. you know, also what was particularly the country music scene yeah. has been close to your heart throughout it. And they're very, from listening to your own podcast series as well, really down to earth people people that you can connect really well with, I find anyway, yeah. most of them seem to be obviously, you know, there's some um, superstars in that scene as well, yeah. go out to Nashville or make it big in the States and everything. But a lot of them are just really ordinary, nice guys. Yeah, you know even I mean? even the, the the American stars yeah. uh, are down home sort of people. You right. know, it's, it's just and I've, I, you know, I've been in Nashville a couple of times. I was, a, I was at a couple of festivals there backstage with all the big stars. And you could walk up to any of them. If that was a rock concert, there would be security guys all over right. the way. You know, Why is it that? might have changed a bit now. I don't know. But yeah. this was back in the kind of uh, 90s. Um, um, I, I don't know. I think it's because they all come from country areas and right. rural areas. And, you know, they're they're a bit more grounded, uh, are they? They're a bit more grounded. Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't know, pop stars maybe tend to come from cities, maybe, or rock stars come Drama from Drama schools, cities. maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, but you're right, the 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 Irish people, like the, the biggest of them all is is Daniel O'Donnell. Like, yeah. And you don't get more down-home, natural, mm -hmm. normal guy than Daniel O'Donnell, you know, who's still one of his biggest, well, he's into golf now in a, bit, in a big way, but playing cards, whist, right. was his big thing. Uh, and still is, uh, and just loves people. I, yeah, they all love people. They genuinely love people. And, you know, you have to in that business mm -hmm. or you wouldn't survive. And people see through people that are just fakes uh, because they have a very close interaction with, with their fans. You know, is that because of the nature of the music and the stage types or is it to do with the fact that they sort of have to grow in a way that some, well, I mean, nowadays, I suppose celebrities are made from one instant on TV, but that's probably yeah. been going on for the last 10 years, has it? But, you know, before that, I suppose, and the country music scene, they start in pubs and yeah. whoever's sitting in front of them is probably there on the big stage in the front seats. That's still. right. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking to, I was talking to Claudia Buckley uh, this week. She's going on, on tour next year with her dad in America, but she was saying that she has great respect for him and she, she's only 25. She saw how difficult it was in that business. He started off playing to 15 or 20 people right. in, in little dance halls and, you know, until he gradually built it up and built it up. So, and they're still with him. So, it is a one to one, mm -hmm. you know, and they're bringing uh, about 150 fans away with them, her fans and his fans uh, to America next year. And they will get to know all of those personally. Right. Daniel O'Donnell, you know, well, he's he's just out on his own. He, he, he's amazing. He should have been a politician. He can remember names. He can re remember personal stories and um, because people would come and tell him after shows, he, he would spend two hours after a show meeting people. Really? Getting and he would know their life stories. Right. And the next time he would meet them. He would say, you know, ask them how their mother was or how mother, is she yeah. doing all right now? You know, that, really? that kind of thing. Yeah. So he's a really genuine. He's really genuine. Oh, he's a really yeah. genuine guy. Yeah. And is that scene particularly, is it almost like 
the GAA? Is it a family nearly that 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 follows that country music scene? That's what it seems to be. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you see that at at, at uh, festivals. Yeah, in particular, you know, they're huge now, particularly during the summer, and it's it's all generations there. Right. It's it, you know the, the the Irish country scene followed on from the the show band scene, so it's really just. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, an extension and I presume of that. the fans know one another, are probably in touch, or they meet one another at a lot of the gigs, and they'll hang out together. And it's That's something right. you could probably go to on your own. That's right. And we, I, I, I go every year on a on a Sunday World uh, trip, a trip that we're associated associated with Sunday World Stars and the Sun to Spain to Torre Molinas. And there's two or three hundred people on that. Just tell me about how that started. <laughs> your first one of those, I find well, it's fascinating. They are. Um, and this is really actually digging into what the culture of the Sunday world was and it's, you know, how mm. that emerged. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the country artists were doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a, a guy called Gordon Marr, who's a, he's, he's a promoter here in Ireland and a manager, he asked the Sunday world to get involved and uh, as, as a media partner uh, because they are our readers who go on these trips, yeah. you know, and uh, all the other artists who, who go on these foreign trips, the advertisement is on the world because they know. And that's what I was going to say, actually, because the country music scene and that scene here was important because you were writing about the stars and mm. the individuals, the upcoming, etc. But there was a time that those pages at the back of the Sunday world were full of where these people were playing. That's right. And that's where you went to, to see where you bought your tickets, where you were going to see them next. It was like there, it was, it was where they advertised, wasn't it? It was, and it still do. Yeah. Um, but uh, somebody said to me one time, Eddie, the Sunday world is the Bible of country music. <laughs> right. The Bible. And because they turn to those pages to see where Mike Denver is playing or mm-hmm. Jimmy Buckley is playing or Robert Mazzell is playing. Um, now it has been diluted a little bit in that, you know, the, the, all these guys have their own Facebook pages yeah. and they can go on Facebook and see. But uh, back in the day, people used to cut out those ads, stick them on their fridge right. and tick off where, what they were going to do at the weekend, where who they were going to go and see. Uh, and the, the, what, the advertising guy who, who, who works on that, his private number is there now. And even to this day, Derek is his name, Derek Tracy. And Derek said on a Saturday night, he'd often get a call. Right. Where is, 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 um, uh, uh, Mick, Mick, Mick Flavin playing tonight. Mm. Do you know Derek? <laughs> Derek is at home with his family on a yeah, Saturday yeah, night yeah. after a hard week's work. Yeah. But yeah, but and Derek is very, uh, very obliging like that. So we just chat. So Gordon came to you and asked Sunday World to get involved. So Gordon, Gordon, uh, it's actually Tommy Swarbrick first, um, and then Gordon took it over. Uh, Gordon and Tommy together, and they they got. Um, Big stars, uh, Red Hurley and Paddy Cole and Linda Martin and uh, various people like that, uh, booked a hotel in Spain, uh, brought in all the gear, set it up in the ballroom. Big cabaret show every night featuring one of these big stars. Uh, and then during the day, uh, people could go sh- lie in the sun by the pool, go do, go shopping. Mm. Uh, a couple of times during the week, there would be uh, Hooli by the pool. And line dancing and all that kind of st- stuff. So this was on. an all-inclusive holiday. All-inclusive sort of holiday with, with, with music and your favorite stars. <laughs> and you. And and <laughs> I I I uh, I go over and and uh, I uh, MC the the concert, yeah. host concerts at night for 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 Gordon. Yeah. So. And I'm sure much crack has had and many stories that stay on. Listen, I mean, they're all in their 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe around, maybe 80, and they're they're hitting the hitting bed around two, three in the morning. Right. And and then they're they're back at it again. They they're they're reliving their their youth. And do people go on their own, or are they just mainly couples? Well, like you like you were saying about about uh, people get to know each other. Yeah. At, you know, at at the at the at the gigs, um, people make friends at these events, and they they arrange then to go back the following year mm-hmm. and meet up, and they mightn't see each other for a full year, but they've become great friends. They've had a great crack together, and then they decide to go on holidays again. Yeah. The, uh, so the world started. Right. So. And I'm sure like that anybody knew would be welcomed into a situation like that. They'd be oh, yeah. open yeah. to. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> what you're doing, what you have there is salt of the earth Irish people. Yeah. You know, and, and they've, they've reared their children. They've mm-hmm. 
their mortgages are paid, you know, they're kind of a bit of freedom now, maybe a few bob in their pockets to go and relax and enjoy themselves and relive their youth. And enjoy the music. Like. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, look, you've had so many, but sort of what, who are standout people for you that you've met over the years, superstars mm. maybe that yeah. are just nice or not? Mm. Yeah, um, mostly nice. But, you know, I couldn't pick out anyone who was, well, they're there. They're not there to offend you, really, you know, yeah. but uh, cause you're doing them a favor by promoting them. But um, in general, the rule was the bigger they are, the nicer they are. You right. know, it's it's the up, young upstarts coming up along that might have a bit, th think this is the way they should be acting, have a little bit of attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they, so anyone from one of my, idols who I would have been nervous meeting the first time, Rod Stewart. Okay. Yeah, Rod Stewart. But a couple of uh, whiskeys did help because it was at a, a after a gig in Wembley Stadium. And for you, uh, not him, uh, obviously. Uh, no, for, <laughs> he was in the dressing room afterwards. <gasps> and uh, and uh, so he, he, he was great. But, the, you know, I've met uh, Beyonce and Kylie and um, Taylor Swift. Now, Taylor Swift. Oh, her concert. Oh, I mean, incredible. She's an amazing show woman, isn't she? She's the biggest star in the world right yeah. now. Uh, you can't get tickets for her concerts. You know, it's, yeah. th there's uh, there's an awful lot of uh, heartbroken people out there who can't get tickets for her new uh, concert tour, yeah, would have which is coming up next year. Using way of I was hearing everyone. Get you have to register, yes. and there are uh, uh, they, they there were it will have will have, have gone on sale by the time this comes out. Yeah, but there are half a million Irish people registered for. Uh, uh, 165,000 tickets, something like that. Okay. So an awful lot of people are going to be uh, disappointed. Sure are, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Taylor so was great. She, like? oh. she is. I am she, a huge <clears throat> fan myself, yeah. I have to say. Well, you know, the funny thing about the last time she played here was in 2018. Mm. And um, her second, she played two Crook Park gigs. Her second concert didn't sell out. So it was only half sold, maybe. So they were giving away tickets, uh, yeah. competition prizes. And I got a few tickets. Yeah. And I was able to bring my daughter and a couple of her friends. And I went. Now, at that time, and you went, yes. <laughs> at that time, oh, yeah. in the lead up to it, she had kind of uh, damaged her reputation a little bit or, you know, the publicity surrounding various things that happened to her. She had uh, spats with, with uh, Nicki Minaj and, mm -hmm. and Katy Perry and uh, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. And she was seen as a serial dater and she was dissing her exes in their songs and it kind of put people off a little bit and she was getting hammered in the media for that. So she came back, she took a break and then she came back with this tour, the reputation tour, rebuilding her reputation. And since then she has gone on to just rebuild her reputation right. and she's seen as, you know, fantastic role model, you know, very strong woman. Um, she's fighting with the record label uh, who, own the masters to her her songs, so she has re-recorded all her albums again and putting them out as Taylor's version and asking her right. fans, the Swifties, to download or stream Taylor's version. And uh, so you, you know, I would have thought she comes across as I mean, I think she's a great songwriter, but she's um, intelligent, highly intelligent. Yeah, yeah. But there again, she's like Daniel. She reminded me of Daniel when I met her. Right. So I actually met her then before that concert in Croke Park in 2018. And my daughter, Laura, and her two friends. And they were only lukewarm about her. They'd kind of gone off her, like many of the fans. But free tickets, free concert in Croke Park, and me, mm -hmm. Taylor Swift, they came along. Well, she charmed the pants off right. them. right. She was so charming and charming to me, to dad, as you call yeah. me, and dad, because when the photographs were being taken, uh, I'm one with dad. And uh, uh, so she was so charming. And um, she said to my daughter, I love your top. Where did you get that? And Laura said, Dundrum, Dundrum Town Centre. <laughs> <laughs> I think Taylor meant which store or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And Laura came out and went. Oh, my God, I can't believe I said Dundrum Town Centre as if Taylor Swift would know Dundrum <laughs> Town Centre. But they all came out going, oh, my God, we love her. We love her. We love her. And she really, you know, she did. She is charming. And she blew me away that night at the concert. And, and the was concert was, good it, was concert. Like a, it was like a, it was like an so amazing yeah. Las Vegas show yeah. in Croke Park. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it interesting, though, that that's really at the heart of what you do because she, um, the media, she she was actually 
sort of not failing, obviously, but not selling out a concert mm. because of the way she was being portrayed and the stuff she was doing in the media and the row she was having and all that. She's taken ownership of it now and presumably charmed more people than just you. Yeah. And she, there's a warmer media to her now. There is. And, and now she's yeah. become this yeah. huge Yeah, and uh, par- star. parents love her because of all those positive messages, you know. So it's funny because nowadays, like, Anybody in, in, in showbiz or in any sort of thing that's public, sports people, they can own a bit themselves of their own story, their own narrative, because they have their own, you know, they have their own social media sites and obviously people are managing them and all the rest of it. And they, most of them, if they've brains, are clever about what they put on them. So they're not going to get cancelled overnight. But the media still matters too yeah. and can make or break them. Yeah. I mean, despite the change in, in, in all that, um, those people, those big stars that come now, uh, do they recognize the Sunday World brand? Do they know of it? Do they Are they aware of it? Well, um, I mean, none of them would ever know, know about the, the Sunday World uh, coming in, but it's the, it's, it's the local record, the record companies here. That do, yeah. And the, the, the um, promoters here, yeah. you know, they recognize the value yes. of Sunday World and, and the value of, you know, how we can help sell records. and They're traveling all over the world, of course, and they can't. Yeah. No. But, you know, so mm. they put themselves in, in the hands of the local local record labels. And, um, you know, I've had, they always big me up. Mm-hmm. Say, this guy's been in the business for X number of years because a lot of them don't, of the Americans, are, have reservations about talking to a tabloid. And I, I had that problem in, in the early years, did you? Yeah, that they didn't want to because the tabloid here in America is is you know is is the National Enquirer and it's yeah uh, you know it's really thrash stuff uh, compared to the paper mm-hmm. we are you know uh, so the record labels used to have to explain the difference um, and then they they always said you know because I'd built up. Uh, a rapport with the record labels and 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 the various individuals. They here, recommend here, you essentially. They would say, "Look at this guy. Yeah. You know, he's he's a you know he 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 does a good job or whatever. And, yeah. Uh, you know, he can be trusted, and you know, he's serious about the work and about the music, and you know, so they would have to do. The, they would have to. Introduce. That was you again building that you know trust mm-hmm. on that tightrope we're talking about yeah. because, and I th- I get the impression in the Sunday world because I've worked in other tabloids back in the day when they would have been tougher, rougher places to work. And um, they were all about the next day. And that was it. They yeah. weren't about the mm-hmm. longevity of anything, be it the journalist or it was the story, the headline. And that's how they operated. I get the impression the Sunday world wasn't like that, actually. No. They saw they had more. They were more thoughtful about the longevity of you as the journalist and about those friendships developing with stars and the paper. Well, sometimes I did have to have a conversation <laughs> and and say, look, you know, uh, tone you know, it down. If yeah, just to, exactly, just tone it down. There's there's no need for this because this is going to affect me doing business with blah blah blah. And mm. in the long term, you know, we get more interviews and more big stories by just not for. You know, for a one shot that yeah. by the afternoon and Sunday, no, nobody cares. They're wrapping their chips in it. Yeah. And if you are, if you're not dealing directly, uh, if you're not in the front line, mm-hmm. you know, if, you, if you're if you a production guy or you're, you're an editor or whatever, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't understand that, mm-hmm. you know, and you don't have to. Uh, so it's up to, to, to the reporter then to explain the situation. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I've had, had that, I did have that conversation once or twice. And uh, but it wasn't know, we have good was, people. I, you I, weren't being put under massive pressure never. to go out and get the dirt. No, never, mm. never. No. So there were people there to invest in you, really. Yeah. To invest in you and, and to invest in those years that you have given to the yeah. Sunday world and all those stories and those interviews and those interesting features and from pages and everything that you brought in as a result of your relationships that you were kind of encouraged really to nurture. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes there might have been just a little bit of pressure in terms of, you know, is there more there? Mm -hmm. And I used to have to say, you know, 
there are, there isn't there isn't the dirt that you think there is there. You know, mm. there, there really isn't. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I, I you know, be, be, because you you build up relationships, pe- people editors think you might be holding back. Mm, you mm. know, and you mightn't be. But you know, You're just it's just you know they're just normal people doing a job yeah i think though as the years have gone on and the media has very much changed it's mm. become much more sort of aware of privacy issues and of stories that are really you know in the public interest or aren't like yeah. that has helped a bit yeah. for those of us on the front line as you say that yeah. um certainly i can recall stories i would have done many years ago that would never see the light of day now in a newspaper, stories about people's sexuality and stuff That's right. like that. That used to be like news stories. And yeah. you kind of even go, I existed with a, a time that, that that was seen as a and, news and, story. You know, and this was of its time. And when I look back at, at the 80s, you know, uh, what we were writing then and the language we were mm. using and, you know, it, it was fine then. Or maybe it wasn't fine, but, it, you know, it was acceptable then, yeah. but it wouldn't be acceptable now. Not at all. Yeah. Absolutely not. And I do think that the media has grown and matured really in a way. Mm. And, you know, nowadays we will go out and meet interest groups of all sorts who don't like a particular word that's used or a particular piece of language. And like you did for all those years, going up to subs desks and explaining to them yeah. why that headline was offensive to somebody. People now come to us all the time and explain why they don't want a word used. And if they have a valid reason, yeah. I think... Yeah. It's a tricky world for journalism now, mm. you know, and for broadcasting. Yeah. Uh, really, really tricky because sometimes it, I, it maybe has gone a little bit too far and, you know. It's the, diluting what's yeah. interesting. It's just that you're worried. You're, if I'm doing a radio interview now, I'm second guessing everything I say. You're terrified you're going to get cancelled. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't been cancelled this far, so I think you're all right. I think you're fine. 500 years later. Who christened you finally, I suppose? Who christened you Eddie Rock and Rolly? Do you remember? That was J.P. Thompson. Was it? Uh, yeah, that was who was, um, he was a, a, an editor and a production chief here. And uh, uh, when I got a column, I got a music column, my first music column in the Sunday World, which was a big deal for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, he, he he called it, he called it Rock and Rolly. Yeah. And, uh, and. Pun on your name. To this day. Stuck. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. To this day, uh, people call me. People call in you business. Andy Rock and Rolly. Yeah. 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 Well, one thing, um, and you do live a rock and roll lifestyle. I have to say, yeah. I will look forward to seeing you. Um, how would I describe it? Um, you know, as we have our fiftieth birthday party coming up in September, you'll be the last man standing <laughs> with a little shot of whiskey in your glass, which seems to go down without having any effect. <laughs> it's an amazing skill. So, Eddie, thank you very much. Pleasure, Nicola.